see you all. Um, if you did not receive the email with the um, source sheet, don't worry. You can get it in the chat, the chat box over there now. Um, tears and laughter, joy and sorrow. Um, and um, uh, if you uh, do not have that yet, you can, uh, you can email us or you can chat over there to Valley Beit Midrash to, um, to request it be posted to you again. So hopefully everyone has that source sheet. And it is a delight to be able to learn Torah in Elul with you, the month leading up to Rosh Hashanah. Hard to believe we're only less than a week and a half away from Rosh Hashanah. And uh, what, a, what, a, what a special time to reflect on, um, reflect on our lives and our moral lives, our spiritual lives, and our emotional lives. And to do that with um, uh, a scholar who has been to VBM before, we, we enjoyed very much a few number of years ago. And uh, you, can, you can hear her, um, her teachings in our, in our learning library. And it is a little bit mean to invite a scholar to speak before, you know, in Elo before Rosh Hashanah, uh, especially when there's so much going on in the world in general. <laughs> but we couldn't imagine this month, month without a self rankle. So we're grateful she accepted. She is a practicing psychotherapist. She's an author a spiritual director and popular public speaker. In her private practice in Albany, California, she works with individuals and couples providing brief and long-term psychotherapy and spiritual mentoring. Um, she's a teacher of Hasidut and mysticism and of Jewish thought in general. And she is the author of Sacred Therapy, highly recommend, and The Wisdom of Not Knowing, also highly recommend. Two, two, two really great books to, to, uh, to check out. So um, with that, um, please join, we, we don't really applause these days, but join me in welcoming from your own, uh, your own, <laughs> your own place, um, Estelle Frankel. She's going to um, offer us some teachings for the next 40-ish uh, minutes, and then we'll have a chance for some Q&A um, in, the, in the remaining uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Estelle. So um, let me just, can I go back into gallery view? Yes. Uh, gallery view there, then I can see all of you, not right. myself. So this theme of tears and laughter and how the high holidays are saturated with stories and prayers meant to evoke both our tears and our laughter. This is a theme I've been developing for many years I even have a special mask I bought in Bali that I wear when I give a, a live drash on high holidays and I wanna talk about the tears and laughter. Here's my tearful sigh. And I flip the mask and it's the laughter, the joyous. And so this little study session is to enter into the two sides of these holy days that have both a light and a heavy, a sweet, and also a, a bitter, broken-hearted sense. There's a story, and this is not a Rosh Hashanah story, this is, there's a story in the Talmud Makot that um, I want to share. It's the last um, source in, in the packet you have, number 18 on page 10. This is an ancient story about Rabbi Akiva, the non-dual master of tears and laughter, this ability to hold the whole enchilada of life, to see the big picture, you know, these days we're zooming in on Zoom. But the ability to hold both tears and laughter requires that we be able to also zoom out and really see life from a wider lens, to see history in its full context um, over the centuries. So in this story, Rabban Gamliel, Rabbi Elisar ben Azaria, Rabbi Yehoshua, and Rabbi Akiva are walking near the city of Rome. Now, did they ever really go to Rome? 
I just cannot wield it. Probably unlikely. Maybe this is one of those um, psychedelic journeys that the rabbis would often go on. So what happened as they walk in the vicinity of the Ro of Rome, they hear the sounds of laughter and you know, the thriving metropolis, and they all begin to cry, but Rabbi Akiva laughs. And they say to him, why are you laughing? He says, well, first tell me, why are you crying? And they say, these barbarians, they bow down to idols, yada, yada. And we, who are the footstools of the divine, we are dealing with the destruction of the temple. And he says to them, well, that's exactly why I'm laughing, because if these evildoers who violate the will of God have it so good, how much better will it be for us? And then it goes through another story, the same Hezraya, the same group. They're walking towards Jerusalem this time, and when they reach Mount Scopus, they see a fox coming out of the Holy of Holies, and they tear their garments, and again they weep, the three of them, while Rabbi Akiva laughs. And you can study the full Talmudic text after the session, because this is just a little bit of backdrop that I want to give you to my uh, high holiday teaching. Basically, they're mourning over the destruction of the temple that they lived through a very dark and difficult time in history. But Rabbi Akiva laughs because he says to them that now that the prophecy of destruction has come true, I'm certain also that the prophecy of Zechariah, the prophecy of the rebuilding and the redemption and the renewal of life, that that will also come true. And the three of them say to Rabbi Akiva, Nicham Tanu, you have brought us comfort. You've reminded us that there's laughter after tears, that there's joy after sorrow, that there's rebuilding after destruction. We're living through epic times of destruction kind of an end of a cycle of history. And undoubtedly, there will be a rebuilding at the end of the day. I'm here in California, and you may hear my voice is hoarse. I'm tremendously hoarse because of the smoke and fires and the destruction of our woodlands. I could tear my garments and there are moments when I'm tearing my hair out in, in uh, sorrow. Everything I love about this land here, California, and I, I'm a California native, is being destroyed right now. And so I'm holding on to this Rabbi Akiva story as a story of hope. So where do we find the tears and laughter in the High Holidays? It's throughout. It's in the liturgy. There are even places in the old-fashioned machzorim where there would be a little prescription in Yiddish saying, this is where the women cry, or this is where we weep, before a particularly poignant prayer. Maimonides, if you look at the text from Hilko Chuba, let me see where this is. If one of you finds it before I do, just unmute yourself and call it out. Well, maybe I can't find it right this second, but Maimonides says it is the ways of the Baal Tshuva, the repentant, to weep. 
that we can't do, here it is, on the top of the last page, top of page 10. Some of the modes of manifesting repentance are that the penitent cries continually before Hashem with tears and supplication. Moments when our hearts awaken, when we return, when we have that experience of the happy ending, of returning to who we really are, returning to God, returning to truth, returning to our heart of hearts, tears well up. I love hanging out at airports and watching people loved ones greet one another when they haven't seen each other in a long time. Once I was at SFO and two little girls, evidently they were sisters. One got off the tarmac, uh, it was walking into the lounge and her sister jumping up and down and they embraced and they were hugging one another and they were weeping I guess they had missed each other so much. And that moment of reunion brought them to tears. And then two seconds later, I saw these same little girls jumping up and down and laughing with each other and doing a kind of circle dance. And it was so beautiful. And it just reminded me of what it's like to do tshuva to return, to reconnect with the beloved. There's a moment of, of tearfulness. I missed you. It's been so long. And then there's the joy that comes after those tears. So that's sort of, you know, another little background piece about the high holidays as a time for weeping and joy. Now, if you if we go through the scriptural readings that we read on the High Holidays, first day Rosh Hashanah, you have this in the packet on page one. We have the story of the angel coming to Sarah and telling her that after all these years of barrenness, she's 90, that she will promising her that she will give birth. And what does Sarah do? She laughs to herself. After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, should I have pleasure? And Hashem said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for Hashem? At the appointed time, I will return about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah denies she laughs, but in fact, we know she did laugh. And that laughter gives Yitzchak his name, this laughter in the future tense. Azima leschok pinu, then our mouths will be filled with laughter. Isaac is a kind of futuristic laughter, that ability like Rabbi Akiva had to see the end when you're in the middle of the story, to remember the joy when there's sorrow. But the laughter turns to tears in, as the story continues, because I'm skipping down, when, um, when Hagar gives birth to Yishmael, and Yishmael is mitzachek, he kind of makes fun, he makes light, he makes laughter. There's some mocking or some kind of sibling teasing going on. Sarah banishes Hagar to the desert, and there, when her water runs out, she puts the child down, and she's certain they're going to die. They're going to perish in the desert from thirst. 
And she went some distance away about an aero flight, I'm reading the bold part, and seated herself on the earth and gave, she gave way to bitter weeping, saying, let me not see the death of my child and the boy's cry, Ishmael's tears come to the ears of God. And the angel of yud heh says to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, why are you weeping? Have no fear, for the child's cry has come to the ears of Hashem. And of course, you know, she's, her eyes are open, she sees the well of water, they drink, they live, he grows to be a man and a great nation. So here, the story of, that begins in laughter ends in tears. Whereas on day two, when we read the Haftarah about Hannah and Penina, that's a story that begins with tears and ends with laughter and joy. Because what happens? Hannah is also barren, while her husband's other wife, Penina, has children, and there's tremendous suffering. And so every year as they would go to Shiloh, she would cry and not eat. And her husband, Elkanah, says to her, Hannah, why are you crying? Why aren't you eating? Why be so sad? Am I not better to you than 10 sons? So that's the beginning of the story, and I'm not going to read all of it. You'll be reading it on Rosh Hashanah. Um, Hannah conceives. She gives birth to Shmuel. And then she sings a song that um, is a song of jubilation. Alatz libi b'Hashem. She's in a state of ecstasy. So um, the word laughter is not used, but you could say that the theme here on the second day moves in the opposite direction, from tears to laughter rather than laughter to tears. <clears throat> the main ritual of Rosh Hashanah, <clears throat> the central ritual is the sounding of the shofar, and Rosh Hashanah is called the Yom Teruah, the day of crying out. The Teruah, Yom Teruah, a day for weeping, a day for crying out. And the shofar sounds are modeled to mimic the sound of tears, to awaken in us the slumbering tears, the, the latent tears that break open the heart. And many interpretations have been given to this ritual. Many associations have been given to um, what so far must remind us of what it must awaken in us. So I want to today focus on uh, the teaching from the Talmud about the sounds of shofar. And so this is on page three in the handout number six. Abaye expounded, there's a disagreement regarding how to sound the teruah. How do we fulfill the mitzvah of um, sounding the shofar, this biblical mitzvah? So this disagreement revolves around how to interpret the word teruah, the passage from Numbers 29 that says it should be a day of sounding the teruah, yom teruah. 
Now, if you look at the Aramaic translation for teruah, for this word, Uncleus says, the teruah is a yivava. This isn't a Hebrew word, this is an Aramaic word, yivava. Now, if they had had Google back then, the way we do now, in those days, the Talmudic scholars were so fluent in uh, biblical linguistics that they had an internal Google search engine. So the minute Ungulus used the word Yevava, they ran through the entire scriptures and they came up with the one and only place where we find this word in scriptures, this, Hebrew, this Aramaic root, which evidently is a Hebrew root also. And that is in the story of, in the book of uh, Judges, the story of Deborah's war against Sisra, who was a Canaanite um, arch enemy of the Jewish people during Deborah's time. Deborah leads the nation in battle and slays Sisra, the Canaanite general. And then when she sings her song of jubilation after the war is over, she prophesizes, Batiyabev Ein Sisra. She has a vision of Sisra's mother waiting at the window for her son to return from war and he doesn't return and she starts to meyabeth, to weep. She starts to mourn, she's weeping. And so the Talmud says, this is Aim Sisra. Now regarding, regarding, I'm back in the Talmud now, the mother of Sisra, the Bible remarks that when she heard of her son's death, the mother of Sisra stood at the window, Batia Bev. One opinion is that the meaning is that she sighed and sighed. And in the Aramaic, in the Talmud, is Genuche Ganach. How, how did she miabev? She sighed and sighed. Her weeping was, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, the way we sometimes when we start to break down and cry. But another opinion says that it wasn't like the shvarim, but rather a gasping sound, a yelule yalil the way that one begins to cry uncontrollably when you completely are taken over by grief. And that, my friends, is, let me demonstrate, it's kind of like, <laughs> like that. Which ironically is not unlike what happens when we laugh hysterically. There's something about out of control laughter and out of control tears that they're almost like my happy sad mask, like two sides of an organismic experience of release. And both tears and laughter come about when the unexpected happens, when reality doesn't match our expectations. When something, you know, you're going along a certain line of thought and then the joke suddenly takes you in a completely different direction, not what you expected, it evokes laughter. And when life dishes out something that we never in a million years could have expected, a pandemic, at least I didn't expect it in 2020, and um, apocalyptic forest fires at this moment. Tears are that response to the unexpected. Now imagine when the shofar is blown, we do both of these sounds. The shofar sounds are whole, 
the tekiya is a whole sound. Shvarim, the broken. The terua, the shattered. And then we always close the phrase with another whole tekiya. It's kind of like life, you know, we come into the world whole, life breaks our hearts. Sometimes things get shattered, but we try to find this wholeness at the end of it all. So I studied this piece of Talmud year after year my whole life. And just in recent years, I began to deepen with it because it's really, really a profound teaching out of the rabbinic unconscious. We learn how to blow the shofar from the tears of Sisra's mother, whose name we don't even know. Scriptures doesn't give her a name. She's one of the nameless, faceless women in, in scriptures. The Talmud could have um, likened the tears of Shofar to the tears of Sarah or Hannah or other people who weep in the Bible. Who weeps in the Bible? Joseph weeps. We'll be talking about Joseph's tears in relation to Yom Kippur. But why did they pick? Aim Sisra, the mother of Sisra. If we look in the Midrash, we see that um, there are Midrashic stories that link shofar sounds to Sarah's tears. And let's let's study this little Midrash together if I can uh, find what page it's on. Okay, page. Abraham, and this is from the story of the binding of Isaac, Abraham comes from Mount Moriah, and Satan is pissed off, furious that Abraham, that he had failed to realize the sacrifice of Isaac. Satan really wanted that to happen. It suggests that Satan maybe was the one who tempted Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And maybe Abraham misheard it as the word of God. Maybe it was really Satan, or maybe God sent Satan. I don't know, some kind of partnership there. So what does Satan do? He goes off and finds Sarah. Ah, Sarah, have you not heard what's been happening in the world? Didn't you read the New York Times? She replies, no. He said, your old husband has taken the boy and sacrificed him as a burnt offering while the boy cried and wailed, here we have the tears again, in his helplessness. Immediately she began to cry and wail. She wailed three times, corresponding to the broken notes of the shofar. Then she died. And that's why it says at the end of the story of the Akedah, and Abraham came home and found her dead. Chaye Sarah, the Parsha, that begins with the Sarah's death, comes on the heels of the Akedah, and this Midrash is trying to link the two stories. So this Midrash is also suggesting, and there's another version of it, um, number five, right underneath, but I'm not going to uh, read both of them. You can take a look at the other version of it. This Midrash does link shofar sounds with Sarah's grief, her wailing, being tricked by the Satan into thinking that she's lost the thing most precious.
for her in the world. So what we have here, either way, in this Midrash or in the Talmud, is that the tears, that the shofar is linked to bereaved women. Like, I don't think there, one could imagine a more terrible pain than the loss of one's child. And father or mother. But the rabbi saw this uh, ritual as um, a way to tune into a pain that is unimaginable. But getting back to why they picked Sisra's mother over Sarah, it never made sense to me until I read a, a drosh by Rabbi Edward Feld, and it goes something like this. That the shofar is, this part's my part, is spiritual open heart surgery. Our hearts get glazed over, they get coated. We have to circumcise the heart. We get numb. What do we especially get numb to? We get numb to the suffering, the Weltschmerz, the pain of a world that is broken, the pain of the world in which there's so much suffering. It's really easy to go numb because it's hard to live in a state of heartbreak. And so every year on Rosh Hashanah, we go through this ritual of spiritual open heart surgery. And how do we do it? We remember the tears of the nameless, faceless mother of our arch enemy. The person we are most likely to dismiss and put out of our hearts, not think about. Like how far does your empathy go? It's easy to empathize for your friends and loved ones, to your family, your community. It's harder to extend your circle of empathy to those that we other, and everybody is othering somebody these days. The right, the left, the left, the right, the stranger. So Sisra's, Sisra's mother is a symbol of everyone that we might put out of our hearts and not have room for. This same theme of radical empathy, of opening up the heart through tears, comes also into the Yom Kippur um, forgiveness rituals. So I want to read with you from the Book of Jubilee, which is um, a text that remained apocrypha. It didn't make it into the canon of um, Jewish scriptures, but it's out there as a midrash. And this is on page six, number under number 12. Let me first say that all these years until I found this teaching, I was certain that Yom Kippur is the day we atone for the golden calf. Because if you read the um, liturgy of Kol Nidre, the whole Kol Nidre prayer, it brings in passages from the story of the golden calf and the forgiveness that comes after Moses goes up a second time, brings the tablets down a second time, prays for forgiveness. And the whole 13 attributes of divine mercy are revealed 
when God forgives us for the golden calf. So I always thought, okay, Yom Kippur, it's about getting over our addiction to idolatry. But here's what the Book of Jubilee says, that in the seventh year of this week, in the seventh year of this week, he sent Joseph to learn about the welfare of his brothers from his house to the land of Shechem. So it, the Midrash starts with Jacob sending Joseph to find his brothers. They had gone off. Jacob was worried about them. And basically, he sets Joseph up in a way to be kidnapped. He finds them in the land of Dotan, and they dealt treacherously with him and formed a plot against him to slay him, but changed their minds, and they sold him to Ishmaelite merchants who brought him down to Egypt and sold him to Potiphar, the eunuch of Pharaoh, chief of the cooks, priest of On, and the sons of Jacob slaughtered a kid. They take a goat and slaughter it. And they dip the coat, Joseph's ketonet, his coveted coat of many colors. They dip it in the blood and they send it to Jacob, their father, saying, you know, look what happened to Joseph. Looks like he got eaten by a wild animal. And when did this take place? The Midrash says on the 10th of the seventh month. So the Jubilee is saying that the sale of Joseph, this archetypal sin of brotherly hatred, took place on the very first Yom Kippur, before even the biblical Yom Kippur. And then there's another Jubilee text also linking. That says that every year we would make atonement for the brothers once a year for their sins for causing this terrible grief for their father who thinks he has lost his son. Again, that unimaginable grief of losing a child. And this day has been ordained that they should grieve thereon for their sins and for all their transgressions and for all their errors, so that they might cleanse themselves on that day once a year. So every year, Yom Kippur is atoning for the sin of putting those, even those who are close to us that we love out of our hearts. When the brothers eventually make their way down to Egypt during the famine and Joseph is pretending to not recognize them, um, they say to one another, this is happening to us because we didn't hear the cries of our brother, Joseph. We were numb. We had no empathy for his suffering. Therefore, this uh, thing is happening to us where Joseph is uh, seemingly going to lock them up, or lock up Benjamin. And what happens at the end of the story, Joseph's reveal party, when he finally finds it in his heart to forgive his brothers, he goes through a process of grieving. If you read, and I, get, I put in the handout all the texts that show how many times Joseph weeps. He's not able to let his brothers back into his heart. He's not able to forgive them until he grieves, until he breaks down that hard-hearted shell that he developed to keep the pain out. 
And when he finally reveals himself, he weeps again. And every time I read this chapter in Genesis, I weep. I don't know why. This story and the book of Ruth always bring me to tears. Something about that moment of opening the heart in forgiveness. And the Torah says that he hugs his brothers and they weep on one another. They've been apart for 22 years. Again, it's like that airport coming back together, coming when we come back in a moment of tshuva, when we open our heart and souls, when we let in those we have pushed out and in those moments of radical empathy, um, the heart opens through tears. So there's a lot more I could say. There's poetic renditions. Um, you can, maybe I'll just read one of them and then you can enjoy the rest of the packet because I want to make time for questions and answers. Let me read the... The Yehuda Amichai poem on page five, a man doesn't have time in his life. A man doesn't have time in his life to have time for everything. He doesn't have seasons enough to have a season for every purpose. Ecclesiastes was wrong about that. A man needs to love and to hate at the same moment, to laugh and cry with the same eyes with the same hands to throw stones and to gather them, to make love in war and war in love, and to hate and forgive and remember and forget, to arrange and confuse, to eat and to digest what history takes years and years to do. A man doesn't have time. When he loses, he seeks. When he finds, he forgets. When he forgets, he loves. When he loves, he begins to forget. And his soul is seasoned. His soul is very professional. Only his body remains forever an amateur. It tries and it misses, gets muddled, doesn't learn a thing, drunk and blind in its pleasures and its pains. He will die as figs die in autumn, shriveled and full of himself and sweet the leaves growing dry on the ground and bare branches pointing to the place where there's time for everything. So let me leave a little time now for your questions and comments. I'll unmute you if you raise a hand or Rabbi Shmuley, do you want to do the unmuting? Thank you. You want to do the sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy for you to do it. Folks can uh, put their questions or thoughts in the chat box, or um, as you said, they could um, let you know and you can unmute them. Um, or, yeah, good. You're stunned, stunned in the silence. I can keep going. I'm like a wind up. <laughs> Let's give it a few more seconds. We'll see. And, and if not, if there's not, yeah, we'll keep going. Okay, even better. So why don't we, Estelle, why don't we go for another 10 minutes and we'll leave the last five minutes. All right. So <clears throat> since we're talking about joy and sorrow here, I'd like to also read this excerpt from The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. It's 
about the interconnectedness of joy and sorrow. Then a woman said, speak to us of joy and sorrow. And he answered, your joy is your sorrow unmasked. And the self-same well from which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with your tears. And how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Is not the cup that holds your wine the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? And is not the lute that soothes your spirit the very wood that was hollowed with knives? When you are joyous, look deep into your heart and you shall find it is only that which has given you sorrow that is giving you joy. And when you are sorrowful, look again in your heart and you shall see that in truth, you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Some of you say joy is greater than sorrow and others say, nay, sorrow is the greater. But I say unto you, they are inseparable. Together they come and when one sits alone with you at your board, remember that the other is asleep upon your bed. Verily you are suspended like scales between your sorrow and your joy. Only when you are empty are you at standstill and balanced. When the treasure keeper lifts you to weigh his gold and his silver, needs must your joy or your sorrow rise or fall. So I think the end of this poem kind of is talking about finding the equanimity, that place that Rabbi Akiva achieved as a non-dual master, as someone who could hold the big picture, who could zoom out and see the arc of history and hold on to the center no matter what was going on. And if you follow all of the rest of the Rabbi Akiva stories, they're all um, along these lines, all the way to his death, that even when he's being tortured among the Asura Haruge Malchut, among the 10 uh, great sages who were martyred by the Romans, Rabbi Akiva goes out with a Shema. He goes out affirming the oneness. Um, and that story about the Asara Haruge Malchut, which is, forms the, one of those texts where we traditionally weep during the Yom Kippur service, the Ela Eskara, after the Musaf, these we remember and it goes through how each of these 10 great sages was tortured to death by the Romans. But there's a story about the martyrology that ties Yom Kippur again back to the story of Joseph, to the unheard tears of Joseph. And we can maybe uh, close with uh, reading this Midrash on page number seven, number 14. And I lifted this translation from uh, the Chabad site. So, the wicked Tumas Rufus, who was a Roman prefect in Jerusalem, who happened to be well versed in Jewish literature, he was learning the passage in Exodus that says, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, is, and the victim is found in his possession, he shall surely be put to death. So Tumas Rufus was, um, 
he realized this was an opportunity to humiliate the Jewish faith when he was clearly making reference to the sale of Joseph, the kidnapping and the sale of Joseph. Our very Torah that tells us that story also says that anyone who does this should be put to death. So he summons Rabban Gamliel and colleagues and presents the question, what is the law about this? And the rabbis say that person should be put to death. Well, if so, where are your forebearers who sold their brother into slavery? Had they been here, I would have prosecuted them before your eyes. As for you, accept the decree of heaven. For since the time of the tribes, there has never been 10 sages of your stature alive at one time. Take upon yourselves to die in accordance with your law, the Torah's law. For Joseph, the son of Jacob, was kidnapped and sold by his brothers, and their punishment has never been exacted. So, basically, the martyrology, the story of the, the liturgy around the martyrology in the Ela Eskara, links us back to Yom Kippur as atonement for the sale of Joseph, for brotherly fratricide or brotherly hatred. Can I jump in here for a minute? Yes, or you? there's a question somebody put in. Yeah, so, you know, it's it's tangential, but it's, it's on my mind in relationship to a lot of this. Oh, actually, sorry, let's go with Michael's question on the side first. Michael writes, I have a question concerning the sorrow from the banishment of Hagar and Yishmael and his return for the burial of Abraham. So what's your question, Michael? You wanna be unmuted? Well, I guess my question is, I think that, that I think we feel a sorrow at the banishment and what's have him and you discussed that in here, but is that mitigated by the fact that obviously a relationship was maintained later on, wasn't it? If, if, if Ishmael came back to honor. Yeah. Abraham. After Abraham's death, they make peace. Was that uh, peace then, or could there have been peace made earlier? Or? Not sure. Torah skips over many chapters, and I, I don't, I'm not familiar with any midrash that fills in the blanks, except that they make peace at the funeral. And sometimes when a parent dies, siblings who've been feuding feud more but sometimes they make peace. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Um, kind of, but I'm thinking about the, uh, you know, the, the, the sorrow versus how we interpret it, that, that there was communication, Ishmael knew there was. Yeah. I, I, obviously, does that mitigate this, the, the sorrow and almost the guilt of the, what seems to be something that Ishmael and Hagar really didn't earn in their banishment and, and in their they didn't deserve or huh? that they didn't deserve you mean yes and, and the sorrow that they went through right and if you read the Ranban Nachmanides says that when Sarah banished Hagar and Ishmael that um, she committed a, a, a terrible misdeed and that our descendants would suffer at the hands of the Yishmaelites for centuries because of that misdeed. You know, and sometimes when we're having a conflict and we don't have good conflict resolution skills, we banish people from our lives. We cut off relationships as our only way to protect ourselves. But if we get better at conflict resolution, we don't necessarily have to have brigas with family members. You know, so many Jewish families have brigas. This one doesn't talk to that one, even though they can't even remember why they don't talk to each other. But at least at the burial of Abraham, there is a, a reconciliation. And 
so may it be, you know, that we can reconcile with all those we're estranged from. That's the story of Joseph. That's the work of Yom Kippur. We begin the work on Rosh Hashanah. We complete it on Yom Kippur. So Estelle, uh, just uh, if I can throw one more question out before we wrap up here. You know, um, these holidays can be so heavy for some people, and um, I don't need to name it all, especially this year. But there are those who like the heaviness of it and those who really struggle with that. And I wonder, like, how do we bridge these two themes? One, which is like guilt, punishment, like fixing our sins, like really heavy stuff that we all should embrace on some level, uh, you know, to different degrees, different situations. And this other was just a message of healing and self-care and kind of uh, self-thriving. And those don't have to be um, opposites, of course. But I yeah. wonder, like, how, how might you think about the relationship between those, a bridge between those? Well, there's a heavy and there's a light aspect. And Rosh Hashanah is a Yom Din. But on Yom Kippur, even though we're repenting, it's done joyously. And we dress in white. We remember we're pure. And the Talmud says that at the end of Yom Kippur, the women of Jerusalem would gather outside the city and dance. And it was uh, Sadie Hawkins Day, and they would, you know, find their life partners and fall in love. And so when pain is released, when we get to the other side of our tears, when we go through a process of tshuva and achieve atonement and forgiveness, there's joy on the other side of that. There's a lightness. Yeah. So I think the work is to, again, to hold both and, and not, to, not to let the sorrow sink us. Um, and I know like in uh, the Hasidic world, there are lots of stories of the dancing, the raucous dancing that would go on on these holy days. And where I live in Berkeley, we certainly dance, we do our share of dancing in a normal uh, holiday cycle. So we repent with joy and love, not just with uh, beating our brows. Yeah. Is that the expression, beating our chests? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Some of us, instead of beating, we even give a little, like a little loving, a little bit of love. Yeah. Okay, any, uh, any closing words you want to say before we wrap up here? Well, uh, I, I think I've said a lot. I want to bless everybody that, this, um, that we all stay well and do good during this difficult time and that we be our best selves and uh, bring out the best in each other and find freedom through release and forgiveness and uh, have a sweet year. Thank you so much. Shana Tova to you. And friends, uh, tomorrow we have a book talk with Esther Amini on the Persian, uh, Persian Jewish experience, facilitated by Alana Storch. Lots of other things going on as well. Hope to see you soon. Estelle Frankel, thank you so much. Wonderful. All right. Bye-bye. Good day. Thank you.